Reading is from 2 Peter 2, verses 10 through 22. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as a wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions. While they feast with you, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was re rebuked for his own transgressions. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. From them, or for them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, for if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, and the sow after washing herself, or the sow, excuse me, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. And God bless the reading of His Word, and the kids can be dismissed off downstairs. If you guys have your bulletins, there's an outline contained within it to guide us along as we finish up chapter two of Second Peter. If you guys have been journeying along with us here in 2 Peter, the last couple of messages have been tough for some of you, I know. The Word challenges us to challenge our assumptions, to challenge our thought patterns, to challenge what we think we know. And I know that it has done that, these la especially these last couple of weeks. And you know what? That's a good thing. It's a good thing that we are considering what the Word actually says and having it being transformational to our lives. In the last chapter, the first three verses talked about false teachers. Those that would purposely and maliciously lead you on a different path, on a different journey. For many of you, it was shocking for many of you, it challenged your view of the world and the TV and the radio and the internet. Last week, we looked at God's judgment upon those that shake their fists at God. And this message today continues that thought. We want to divorce this idea in the Old Testament is the wrathful view of God and in the New Testament, it's just the God who is all just love. Newsflash, same God. He's just demonstrating himself. He's showing his qualities and attributes in two different ways. To two different sets of people and at different times. It's still the same God, but we're just like seeing a diamond and rotating it, seeing a different facet of that same diamond. Different light is reflected different views, different perspectives. That's my, kind of my challenge for us as a church is to be willing to 
look at different facets, different aspects, and see how it adds to the whole. It's hard for mankind to grasp a full understanding of who God is. So we often compartmentalize God. We look at the wrathful, vengeful God in the Old Testament, put it in a box and put it over here, label that Old Testament, and then we see a loving, caring God that sacrifices for the world in, in the New Testament. We put that in a box, put it over here, label that New Testament. And yet we're oftentimes unwilling to open up both packages and to see how they fit together like one of Hannah's Lego sets. And that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we're giving you a piece of the Lego set that's showing that God is both loving and just, is both gracious and righteous, all at the same time. It's, it's something that our brains have a difficult time understanding how all of these qualities, all of these attributes work at the same time when in fact, just as your body has many functions that operates at the same time, even subconsciously, those are different qualities that no matter whether your mouth is moving, we know that it works. It's an aspect of who you are. Your brain constantly thinks, although in this modern society, I don't know how many brains are actually working. I saw a meme yesterday. It was a painting of Descartes, and it said he would be surprised today in seeing people who don't think but are. We know his famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. In our modern society, there's many who are and don't think. So let us actually turn that on in our brains and actually think this morning about the passage that's before us. Diving in in chapter 2, picking up where we left off in verse 10. And especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Today is entitled, Especially Those. Especially Those. In the last several verses, we've seen that God is currently judging and will judge the unrighteous. We looked at the fact that God brings judgment on people in their lives for sin even today. Many of us could look to our family and see God's judgment come upon somebody who has rebelled against him year after year after year and then face consequences for their sinful actions and desires. I've mentioned how my uncle had passed away from his decisions and desires in his life. We can look at the newspaper and see people who shake their fists at God and then wonder why their family is a mess. Then wonder why it is sometimes lives are quote-unquote cut short. And we don't think that, that God is not fair in judging here and now. In fact, he can. We always want to push it off into the future. We always want to say, well, God will judge in the future. Every, everything's delayed. Not everything's delayed. Sometimes judgment happens here and now. Especially to those. Here Peter says, yes, there's this class of people over here in which God is judging here and now, but there's another class. We often want to lump everybody together. God just loves everybody unconditionally across the board. Well, look through the Old Testament and see how he chose a people and blessed them. He could have chosen anyone, yet he chooses Abraham and his seed. Why didn't he just choose the whole world and all of the world as his chosen people? Why Abraham and his descendants? It's his choice. It's his design, his plans, his purposes, not mine. 
but we want to reject that. We want to say, oh, no, 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 no. That, that's not the God in whom I worship. Newsflash. You can create a God after your own image, your own likeness, your thoughts, your patterns, and to overlay that on top of the Bible and God revealing who he actually is. So my goal, my, my hope is that this image that we've created in our minds of who we think God is, and when we overlay it on top of the Bible, and so I can kind of see the verses through the page, but not very well. I, I've created a barrier between me and what it, God has actually said. My goal for all of us is that we're able to take those presuppositions, big fancy word, and to actually see what it says. To be challenged by it and to remove the things that we've heard all our lives. The things that we've heard, TV, the radio, the internet, that prevent us from seeing the page clearly. And instead, be willing. And sometimes that takes a dose of humility. We don't like to eat humble pie, do we? Sometimes I need to realize that this image that I've made of God is more about me than it is about God. So Chris has to get out of the way of my understanding of Scripture. I have to remove myself and my assumptions and my placing my image in what I understand upon God. And instead going, who is actually God? What has he said? And even when dealing with tough passages as this, that God would judge people on different basis? That there are some that are going to be judged worse than others? Yeah. When speaking of the eternal place of punishment, Jesus said there are going to be some that are beaten with few stripes and some that are going to be beaten with many stripes. And the parallel is in the New Testament. We see that some are going to receive many crowns some will be, get there but receive no crowns. And in fact, their tails will be on fire, so to speak. They'll just get in by the hair on their chinny-chin-chin. It shows God's equity. The very fact that if there are different levels of punishment on one end, there are different levels of reward on the other. That shows that God is just and that he is righteous and that he is in fact fair but he is also gracious. We often use the phrase, there go but by the grace of God, right? And yet, we don't realize that the opposite is true. That we could be especially those. Those that have corrupt desires. Doesn't take us very long to look around us and to see corrupt, or as often some translations put it, debased desires that go unchecked, that in fact many are advocating, well, I just want to, to be free in my debased desires to do whatever it is that I want, even if it hurts other people. This is where we have to draw the line. This is where Peter draws the line. In fact, he mentions it as the first thing, especially these. This is a separate class of people that is going to receive judgment both here and now and in the future. And especially those, the connection here in verse 10, these two things go together. Like peanut butter and bananas on a sandwich, it goes together. I know, it's an Elvis thing. It's actually good if you've actually ever tried it. Or peanut butter and jelly. We'll step back and say peanut butter and jelly, even though I don't like it. Those that have these debased desires all are always challenging authority, especially God's authority. They will always go, did God really say? Oh, the Bible doesn't really say that, does it? Oh, no, we're just going to interpret it as meaning something else. It has been consistent through mankind's history. 
that mankind, when they want to go along with their sin, when they want to approve of their debased desires, they, they want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel religious. Everybody wants to be some type of religious. But when God's word goes against their desires, they have to go, oh, wait, I'll just skip that part. Or I'll just make it say something else. Erase, erase, erase. Insert themselves into the text. Your first fill in the blank this morning is despising authority. They'll despise God's created authority in the church. And they'll despise his authority, period. An easy way to point out the especially those is look for the pronouns they use, the descriptors. The I, the me, and the mine will show up everywhere. When instead, if you are a follower of Christ, you should be asking, what does God want? What is he commanded? What is he desired? instead of me. Get Chris out of the way and instead be looking for what God wants. His plans, his purposes, his desires. Verse 11. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring reviling judgment against them before the Lord, although they could. Here are these debased people Cursing God and even cursing angels. Interesting. There's a song that came out in the early 2000s. And I'm not going to mention the name of the song, but a line in the song says, Angels deserve to die. And the song is about suicide. This group was willing to shake their fists at God and to, as Peter says here, revile angelic beings. Other entities that God has created. And yet, if these people are under judgment for reviling against angels, let's take that into our realm. What is it that when we revile each other? What did the Lord say said, it, talking about the Ten Commandments, oh, it's good, you know, you haven't murdered, but have you said raka to your brother? Have you hated your brother? That's just the same as murder. Oh, yes, we may not say that angels deserve to die, but if we hate our brother, it's no different than this special class that's going on here. This separate group that Peter's pointing out. And in fact, the word he uses is blasphemous. People blaspheme God all the time. They use his name in vain. They attribute things that aren't who he is to himself. But there's judgment if you blaspheme even the ones he has created. Here specifically it mentions angels. That you would cause harm or that your attitude and your words bring judgment upon the angels. And yet, as Peter says here, they're not willing to bring in an accusation against you. Hopefully you guys have read Job. In Job, we're given a picture of heaven. The angels come before the Lord. None of them are pointing out that the errors and, and the vileness of the world but the fallen one does. Satan does. He is the accuser of the brethren. The angels, they could, as they go about their duties, whatever that might be, and to say, hey, Lord, you know, Chris really screwed up this week. But they don't. It's, it's an amazing thought that even they are careful about bringing accusations against another part of God's creation. That they understand their position, that they understand their relationship. So should we. 
if the angels refrain from causing judgment to come upon someone else, we should be careful that we don't bring judgment upon each other. That we're so easy to point out faults, that we point out logs, or we have logs and we're trying to point out slivers. But it's our nature. It's, it's kind of who mankind always goes towards. In fact, as Brent was talking about in Sunday school the last several weeks and looking at Cain and Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? In a sense, yes. And in fact, you blasphemed God by killing him. That you did not see the value that God placed in your brother and you actually killed him. It's the same category as the people that Peter's talking about here. And in fact, if we go to verse 12, but these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed. In a commentary on this very verse, there's a phrase that has come up through Christianity for a number of years. And every once in a while, you'll hear it. And maybe you guys know the phrase, maybe you don't, giving you a new thing to say when you look out at the world and people are doing the things that they do, is heathens are going to heave. Heathens going to heave. The phrase is nearly 500 years old at this point, but it's apropos to the situation. Here, Peter's pointing out this special group of people that are under judgment from God, and sometimes you have to just step back and go, they're going to do what they're going to do. Heathens going to heave. That They are resistant, not just resistant, they shake their fists at God. They blaspheme God. They're going to do what they're going to do until God changes the heart. I can't change them. Christy can't change them. Brent can't change them. Only by a supernatural work of God do they change from being heathens to being the children of God. Sometimes, yes, you have to give them truth, but sometimes you just got to say, heathens going to heave. And step back and let them bring the judgment upon them. I just pray I've stepped back far enough as to not get some some blast radius from when the judgment does come. Verse 13. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reviling in their deceptions and as they carouse with you. They're suffering the wages. Your next fill in the blank this morning. Hmm. Sounds like a very familiar uh, phrase for those of you, especially the kids in here that have had memory verses. Wages, wages. The Bible talks a lot about wages, but the wages of sin is death. Peter's just saying what Paul has already said, that they're working for their death. So step back. Let them earn their keep. Yes, give them the truth, but many times you give them the truth and all it does is give them more ammunition to blaspheme God. There does come a point in time when you're talking with friends, your family, your loved ones, in which you do have to draw a line in the sand and say, you know what, you, I have given you the knowledge you need in which to seek eternal life. But I'm not going to continue pouring condemnation or judgment upon your head. Because if I continue to tell you about God's love towards mankind, about the scriptures that reveal who he is and what he has done, all it is going to do when the day comes, the books are going to be opened and the Lord's going to go, you know, you heard from Chris on this day, this day, this day, this day, and this day about death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet you still blasphemed me. Well, you know what? Those are more charges that go on your account. As the Lord said, more stripes, not less stripes. 
So we have to be careful. The Lord even said, you know, do not cast pearls before swine. We often think we're in American culture. We think, you know, just gospel, 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 gospel to try and force them to convert. All that does is make a religious heathen. There's a whole lot of those out. We don't want to admit it. Yes, there are religious heathens, those that still blaspheme the name of God, but still dress up really nice on Sunday, come in, sit in a pew for their hour, checked it off on their checklist, and still it makes no difference in their life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Peter's making that connection with those that he's seeing, this special group that they are going to earn their keep. The big question is, something as I was looking at this in verse 13, that they revel in the daytime. Often when you go into your house and you turn on the light, the mice or the cockroaches scatter. Yet these are so bold that they do their blaspheming against God in the daytime, out in the open, for everyone to see. In fact, uh, Eric sent me a photo of a recent pride parade in which, in the daytime, in front of many children, they were doing things that should not be done in front of children. In fact, in many states would be considered lewd, and lascivious behavior would be arrested for indecent exposure and the, uh, what is the phrase, the corruption of minors, and yet it's celebrated. Go ahead, you know, the, we've got these set of laws, but it doesn't apply to you during this week or this month, but then when it's not this month, then it goes back to what it's supposed to be. The same thing Peter was dealing with. This whole group, this special people under judgment, were so bold that they were willing to do their debased things in the daytime. We've been so used to in America, especially my grandparents and great-grandparents' generation, that this was in the dark, in the closet. It was still there. It was just hidden. Now we really know the depths of what it is. We know the depths of, uh, in fact, one of the cries, at one of the, the rallies in San Francisco is we are proud and we're after your children. I can't make this stuff up. I've got a video clip on my phone. We are proud and we want, we are after your children. They were they put the kids on the curb in the front row. Revel in the daytime. Verses 14 through 16 as we close up this morning. Having eyes full of adultery and never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls and having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, and having gone astray, following and have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who lived, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. For he received a rebuke from his own transgression for a dumb donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are the springs without water, misdriven by the storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. Your next fill in the blank is following Balaam. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. If you were to ask me some of the, the craziest fun stories in the Bible, Balaam. Uh, we find him in Numbers, and he's mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament. He's mentioned negatively, but I remember him for the fun part. An angel is preventing his way from cursing the people of Israel. He's riding a donkey, and he's beating the donkey because he can't see that the angel is blocking his way. The Lord opens up the mouth of the donkey and said, 
you better stop beating me. There's an angel with a sword about ready to cut off your head if you continue to beat me. God can even use a donkey. That's my favorite little phrase from that experience with Balaam. But everyone wants to paint Balaam as a good prophet. Sorry. Balaam wasn't surprised that the donkey was talking. Balaam was very much into witchcraft and into sorcery. He was used to things talking that shouldn't and seeing things that were supernatural. This was no surprise to him. What he was doing was he was making his money. Yes, he was a prophet. Yes, he was allowed to to know things that would happen in the future, and he used it for his benefit. He was willing to to be paid by a king to curse the people of Israel. The problem is, is God prevented him from doing so. Every time he got the opportunity, God prevented him. Instead, he would bless Israel. But eventually, in the story, he does end up being a downfall towards Israel. He says, oh man, I can't curse them. But you know what I can tell you to do? Send your women down on in. They'll get to know each other. And that offspring has been a thorn in Israel's side ever since. These same people that Peter's talking about follow the way of Balaam. They are so corrupt that they're willing to take money for their evil and call it good. And they're willing to blaspheme God and God's people in order to do it. In Revelation chapter 2, we see another reference to Balaam. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. In the times I have heard preaching and teaching on Balaam in Numbers chapter 22, he's always been painted as a good prophet. I don't know why, because he's actually a false prophet. In in the Greek Septuagint, the Old Testament translated into the Greek, is uk prophetes. He's a bad or an anti-prophet. And yet we want to paint him, oh, you know, he was just misguided, or he was just on a different road. No, he in fact blasphemed the name of God. And here in Revelation, this church is, in fact, some of them going after the same things Balaam had advocated for. I hope no one at Mount Pleasant's down that road. I'd hope and pray that that none of us are, are using our religiousness to make money and our religiousness, in fact, to curse God or to curse God's people. But if If the church in Revelation can do it, if some of those in their midst were willing to do it, it could happen here. And this type of people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. We were talking, Al, we were talking about a drought earlier, right? I come from Southern California, which is pretty much always in drought. If you've ever been through the desert in Arizona or Nevada, when it's often dry, it can often get windy as well. What happens when you mix dry dirt and wind together? Sandstorms. These people are so without, in, in the New Testament, the picture of the Holy Spirit is usually water or a dove. These people are so absent from the Holy Spirit, so absent from following God, that they're so dry, they're like the dust of the ground. And that when the wind comes, it gets picked up and it becomes a storm. And yet we let it become that. We let it become a storm that affects everyone and everything, rather than cutting it off at the pass. If it weren't for the angel, and if it weren't for God's prevention, Balaam would have cursed Israel. Just as if it weren't for God's protection on America and the churches in America, there would be a dust storm, spiritually speaking, of epic proportions that would destroy America. And yet God restrains evil. That's one of the biggest things. I remember 
I've had a, a large theological change in the last 15 years. One of those big changes was realizing that God, through his spirit, restrains the evil of mankind. That mankind is not as bad as they could be. Oh yeah, they, we can be really bad. We can have Hitlers and Pol Pots and all kinds of evil. But God restrains that. That it could have actually been worse. And in people. That's a blessing beyond measure. And yet, many of us either don't believe that that's the case or don't praise God that that's the case. That's our own fault. If it weren't for the fact that God restrains these things, we would have a sandstorm from this picture here in Arizona, spiritually speaking, of a great judgment coming upon many that are this dry dust of the earth in which there is no spirit in them. Almost done this morning. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity entice fleshly desires and sensuality. Those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves to corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enticed. These are slaves of corruption. You guys have heard the phrase, what you eat is what you are. But somewhat the opposite is true. What you do is what you are. These people are evident in who they are by what they do. Sure, they may talk. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Many people can come to church and say, yes, say the magic word. Say, I'm a Christian. I've said the magic prayer, the Lord's Prayer. I've said the magic prayer uh, of receiving Christ. But their words... And what they do don't match. They can say one thing and have something totally different. It's one of the things I know John's concerned about in our discussions. As many people even here have been here at Mount Pleasant, have, have said the magic words, had their name put in front of the Bible and the date and time. But it never meant anything. For as he thinks within himself, so... He is. Proverbs 23, 7. What is it that you really think? Does your profession of faith mean you have possession of it? There's many people that can say that they have made a profession, but never have possession. One of the biggest things that we want for you is to have possession of that faith. That it means something in your lives beyond just coming to church here for an hour and almost half on a Sunday morning. And that be it. We would not want you to be the, the dry desert getting kicked up by the sandstorm. But instead hold to the anchor of life which is Christ. Hold to the sure rock and not to be blown away. Last two verses this morning. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Your last fill in the blank this morning for if. Words matter in Scripture. We have to watch the conditionals. It says, for if. This is not the universal case. This is a specific case. Here, Peter is saying, some of these are even in our midst, and some of them say that they are Christians, yet they're driven like the sand. Some of them say that they're Christians, but they flaunt their debased desires in the open. You have to question if the profession matches the possession. The profession matching the possession. In fact, we see in both James and John, 
they will talk about this class of people and say, there are those who say, he who says, oh, you've got faith? Oh, oh, I'll show you my faith by my works. But it doesn't match up. They'll say it, but in James, they never show it. And vice versa is true. We just go on into 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. There are those, if someone says he is without sin, he is a liar, and the truth is not in them. They said that they were this holy, great person, that they never sin, and yet there's no possession of true faith. We need to be careful to separate those, those out. Yes, that's where the, the unloving word, quote-unquote, judgment comes in. And don't quote me Matthew 7, 1, because we are to judge inside of the church. The outside of the world, as we looked at last week, is already judged. We don't need to. We can step back and let that judgment come. But we need to match those who say with those who possess. And to be willing to say when there's a disconnect between those two realities. And yes, you're right, it is hard. It requires discipleship. And discipleship's a word we don't like. It requires us to be challenged by the words in which we sing, sing and say and read and go, does this match what I say or does it match what I do? And these people, oh, this, actually, I forgot this slide was in here. Uh, someone who some folks here are related to said this. The problem in the church today is not the profession of faith, but his possession. And he was 100% correct. There's a lot of people who can talk the talk. A lot of people can flap their lips. But the bigger question is what they do. How they live life the big question that we've had or that Mount Pleasant has had for some time is how to match the profession with the possession. And lastly, is like a dog returning to its own vomit. Who here has had dogs? I had a German shepherd growing up as a kid. Her name was Shira. My mom named her after She-Ra, the cartoon. And she, I don't know if it was a stomach thing or what, but she would often throw up after eating. And doggone it, if she didn't go back and eat it. And I'd be like, no, don't kiss me, don't. Mom, do we have like doggy mouthwash or what? Because it was, you could smell it on her when she came up to you and tried, no, no, get, get away with me from that. Thankfully, my pug growing up didn't do that. He just, if he threw up, he left it over there and didn't, didn't go back to it. But these people and the, and their lifestyles, because it's just profession and no possession, continue to go through the cycle. They'll engorge themselves, they'll throw up, and then they'll go back to the same thing that they did over and over and over again. Until God breaks that cycle, they're stuck. And we need to recognize that. We need to step back and go, I'm, I'm hearing one thing, but we're seeing this cycle that, that never seems to end. We need to match possession with profession. And that's how, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. You know, why is it that we wash up hogs and cows when we know they're going to go right back to the dirt they came from. In the same way, in the church, we've done the same thing. Oh, just get people cleaned up, come to church, we'll sit them in the front row. When it's not going to change them, they're going to go out from here, from that pew, outside the doors, back to their lifestyle, back to that cycle. We cleaned them up, yeah, for a couple of hours on Sunday, quote-unquote. But it didn't change their lives. We should be asking God that, that if these are going to become one of your children, 
that you would change their hearts from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. That you would give them your spirit and cause them to live rightly so that what they say can match what they do. That is our challenge. That we're, we as the church are stuck in the middle between those that are currently being judged and those about to be judged in the future. That as we walk through life in the middle between them, that we're willing to say, God changes lives. And we've seen it happen. But to continually pray and to give them the good news and to be willing in church, in our group with us, to match professions with professions, possessions, excuse me, for us together to push those two together so it becomes the same person, so that we match the walk and the talk, so that none of us are, as James and John put it, those who say. With that, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this tough passage. These tough passages challenge our assumptions. They challenge what we've been taught, what we've learned. Challenge our relationships with others, with our friends, our family, our loved ones. To step back when we see them blaspheme you. And yet be ready to give the good news at any moment. Lord, may our profession match our possession. And may, may we be a people that is after your plans, your purposes, and to get us out of the way. Now, Lord, as we sing, may you hear us. Lord, as we prepare for VBS, may you be working in the hearts and minds of the parents and the kids that are to come. And to give energy and enthusiasm and endurance to the workers uh, who will labor tirelessly in these next four days.